The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, the glory of your people Israel. Child's father and mother marveled at what was said about Jesus. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, The child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to be the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own hometown of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to So we have this feast day that places us squarely back into the beginning of St. Luke's Gospel. And this story that we hear in our Gospel today is unique to Luke's Gospel. And when there's a story that's unique to one of the gospel question, uh, one of the Gospels, it always leaves me questioning, why? Why does Luke tell this story? What's so important about this presentation of Jesus to the Lord God? that he includes it in his gospel. And what I'm, I'm reminded of is Luke was writing to primarily a Gentile audience about 50 years after the Jesus event. And his community was asking, why should we follow a Jewish Messiah? What did he bring to us that our own gods and goddesses don't ha- present to us in the Roman mythology, in our own culture, why would we attach ourselves to Jesus? And Luke says something to them about the nature of sacrifice. How many of you have ever offered a sacrifice? For what reason? Why would you offer a sacrifice? Bob, do you want to offer something? Why would you offer a sacrifice? Say it again. 
So to sacrifice some of what you have for, to lift somebody else up out of maybe a difficult situation. So kind of an act of generosity. Okay. Have you ever offered a sacrifice to God? A, a, a kind of thanksgiving, okay. Yeah. So what, part of what's going on here is an interesting play that Luke is making on the nature of, of sacrifice because we hear about Joseph and Mary going to the temple to offer a sacrifice. A sacrifice that would have been different than the people who grew up in the Roman Empire, why they would have offered sacrifice to God. Because they did that. They went to the temples, to the gods and the goddesses, and they offered sacrifice, whether it was some money or maybe it was an animal or something from their own uh, goods, something that they believed belonged to them. They would give it to God to convince God to be good to them. To change God's mind and heart about them. To bestow goodness or blessing upon them. But the Jewish sacrifice was closer to what Bob was talking about, closer to what Jerry was talking about. They were offering sacrifice to God out of thanksgiving. Out of gratitude. Not to convince God of something because the Jewish people were the first ones to remind us that God bestows goodness upon us not because of what we give God or who we are but because of who God is God the generous God the merciful God the compassionate that is who we offer sacrifice to and so we hear this 40 days after the birth of Jesus after Mary's confinement is over her blood has been purified she can enter back into the community 40 days that magic number, right, that symbolic number that means the amount of time it takes to change, to experience conversion. They go into the temple with the infant Jesus. He's already been circumcised. He's already been named Yeshua, the name that means God is saving. And they bring him into the temple to present him to the Lord. Why? Because the law reminded them that every firstborn male of every creature belonged to the Creator, belonged to God. And so the parents would go to God and say, we sacrifice to you that we might receive back our son. And we promise to you, God, that we will care for him and we will bring him up in a righteous way so that he can be your presence for our people. So he can be the goodness that you desire for our people. That he can be part of your kingdom. This was the promise that all parents made. And so we hear this story play out today. Luke telling of Joseph and Mary bringing Jesus into the temple. Why? To fulfill that prophecy of Malachi. One day the Lord will show up in the temple. And who will be able to stand before him? Who will be righteous enough to stand before the God? And on this day, God comes to the temple in the form of the baby Jesus. In the form of this child who is presented in the temple. And who is there to receive him? We're told Simeon. Simeon, this elderly man whose name means God has heard. And Simeon, who has spent his life in the temple of Jerusalem, waiting for the consolation of his people, crying out to God day and night, offering sacrifice, saying, God, free us from our oppression. Save us from ourselves. Save us from our sin. Help us to see our unrighteousness that we might return to you. He has spent his time in the temple and here we have Jesus presented to him. And I don't know about in your imagination if you can picture this elderly gentleman holding this infant in his hands, gazing into his face, looking into his eyes. Are you picturing a child right now? Maybe the last time you held a child. And he proclaims, God 
you can let your servant go in peace. I, I see your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the sight of every people. A light, a light in this child that will reveal you to all the nations, the Gentiles, and will bring glory to your people, Israel. Simeon proclaims the truth. And the thing that strikes me about this scene, though, is Mary and Joseph's response. It says they marveled at what he said about Jesus. As if they were hearing it for the first time, that this child, as Simeon goes on to tell them, is destined to bring about the rise and the fall of many in Israel. Why? Because Jesus will live a life, a righteous life, a life of compassion, a male body with a female soul, bringing about the mercy of God, the generosity of God to people who long to hear the good news, to hear that they are favored, that they are blessed. He will live a life that will trouble people. They will speak out against him. People's hearts will be revealed as they say, watching Jesus, that is God or that is not God. They will reject him. Some will follow. Some will be confused and some will be enamored. People's hearts will be shown. The truth, the rise and the fall. And Mary, you, even his mother, you will have to choose. Is this the Messiah of our God? That sword that divides? Will you choose to see God's goodness and great works through your son even as he bleeds out on that tree? As you watch him in agony? Will you believe that this is the love of God being poured forth for the world? This sword will pierce your heart as well. Because see, the people in Luke's community, they had to choose. Do they see the love of God in the story of this Messiah named Jesus? Does it make a difference for them? Does their following him help them to make a difference in the world? That's the question that was laid before them that day through Joseph and Mary. Can you see the love of God in a crucified Messiah? But you know, we're told that Anna the female counterpart to Samuel, whose name means favor or grace. She too has lived her life, 84 years, seven times 12. Another biblical new number that's symbolic, the fullness of abundance in her, the fullness of their longing in her, proclaimed, this is the one. We don't have to wait anymore. This is the one. Place your hope in him. And after, Sam, after Simeon and Anna have witnessed to the light that will be revealed in Jesus, we're told that the family returned back home, back to Nazareth, back to the Galilee, Back to that place that dwelt in darkness we heard recently. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali. A light comes back into their midst. And we're told that Jesus grows up strong in wisdom and in the grace of God. But you know, my friends... What's revealing itself to me is that Jesus did not grow up that way because God magically placed his finger on him and set him out as special. No, Jesus grew up that way because he lived with righteous parents. He watched them model 
mercy and compassion and faithfulness and prayer and generosity. He watched them go to the temple and to watch them to go to the synagogue to pray. He watched them lift other people up and heal. That's what formed him. God worked through his parents. It made a difference that when Jesus was called into his public mission and ministry, that was a part of him. It was in his bones. That was the God he knew he was called to save to serve, to love. So I think there's two things that are shown to us today for us to continue to reflect on. I know some will probably hear this as blasphemous, but what I imagine is that what Simeon proclaimed in the temple that day about Jesus is exactly what God proclaims about every child born in history. I think Joseph and Mary's amazement was the same amazement that every parent hears when somebody says, your child is destined for greatness. Your child is beautiful. Your child will do great things, wonders. To have somebody say that about our children or our grandchildren makes our hearts swell, doesn't it? Simeon proclaims what Joseph and Mary longed to hear about their son. He will do great and wondrous things. We are invited, you and I are invited, when we hold that child in our hands, that image of God that is placed in our midst, that life of God that continues to be born into the world today, we can proclaim with faith, my God, you let your servant go in peace. Your words have been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen your salvation. That's the promise we have in every child born. It is the spirit of Jesus the Christ who fills those children who brings hope to the world today. And it is a family that lives in fidelity and righteousness that brings that hope to fruition. That like Mary and Joseph, when we live in faithfulness to God, we give our children a chance to know the God we are called to serve. Let us pray today. Let us be present to God today that those words of Simeon and Anna might flow from our lips freely into our world.